thank you for coming to this talk. I'm, I'm pretty excited to share all of this with you. And uh, as a concern of mine, just because the amount of material that I'm trying to uh, tell you, uh, let's hold questions to the end. Uh, I'll make myself available and then on the Slack uh, channel for this talk, feel free to add anything and I'll make sure I get to it. So uh, before I really get into it, I just want to acknowledge the people that made this work possible. So I work at KNC, a small consulting firm based out of Los Angeles. And uh, Joe Maglianis uh, was the one who f funded it, so big thank you. And then Jeff Limbacher is a coworker of mine and really helped with some of the statistical work that was done in this as well. So what, you, what should you expect from this presentation? Well, really I want to give you intuition and starting points so that if you find any of this stuff in interesting, you can kind of jump uh, step some of the initial work that needs to be done just to learn the vocabulary and learn kind of what's going on in the field. Uh, more concretely, of course, it's gonna be four parts. So the, the problem that I'm really fascinated with is how do we model human movement? And what I mean by that is given a configuration of people uh, in an environment, and each person has a trajectory that they wish to uh, arrive at, uh, how can we predict the movement of those people in that space? Uh, so that's, that's the question. I find that uh, anytime you're kind of jumping into a new field, it's, it's good to know the history and why that, that problem became uh, a field in itself. And so what we're gonna do is kind of look at some of the stages of crowd dynamics as a field and to understand why uh, it is where it is today. Uh, maybe not surprisingly, anytime there's kind of a engineering tone, oftentimes it's just practicality that drives the, the need. And in this case, uh, in the 60s, a paper by Fruin uh, was one of the first to actually quantify what uh, like good sidewalk design was. And he borrows from this uh, a lot of the, the work that was being done in traffic uh, kind of sciences and highway design. And the, the term that they use is level of service. So you can designate certain kind of corridors with a level of service based on the amount of, of people that kind of comes through that space. This isn't really, uh, I guess, the, the, this, this concept should make sense, um, but the way it was able to actually be done is that uh, photography really allowed someone to actually analyze uh, kind of the trajectories and the changes that would go on. And so photography was instrumental in being able to do this work. And what you see on that right side is kind of the, the six levels of service, and they're termed by A to F, and that just kind of designates the density of a, a certain space with kind of what you should expect in terms of speed or the flow of that, that kind of movement of, of people in that space with that many people. So in the 70s, uh, people started, you know, actually looking at, at crowd dynamics more closely, and they started to see resemblances of particles in space. So again, I don't think that this is a very big conceptual jump to make, but what uh, this paper by Henderson was able to show was that we can apply Maxwell Boltzmann's kind of mechanics and uh, states of gaseous uh, particles and say, what if we make those same assumptions about people and how well does that correlate with sort of data that we have? And so that, that's kind of leading to more of a physical-based understanding of movement, movement uh, and less about uh, the actual practicality of designing good streets. Though this work is helpful in actually analyzing whether your kind of streets are designed well. So then in the 90s, we start getting kind of an explosion of, of kind of new concepts, and this is really in part because we now have computers to actually do some of this simulation for us, and so we can actually encode some of these principles and then see, do our simulations actually match uh, with the data that we have? And so this paper called the uh, Social Force Model uh, for pedestrian dynamics is really interesting. The concept is that every time you move around a space, you're bombarded by forces that either attract or repulse you. Uh, to give a really clear uh, description of, of what this is, imagine if a, a wall is on fire, you definitely don't wanna walk right next to it. So there's a force that's repulsing you away, and the, the concept here is that acceleration, velocity, and all of those actual uh, quantifiable metrics can be distilled down as a summation of all of those forces that you can attach. 
Uh, so pretty interesting model, and uh, it's still used today, and, and uh, helping uh, is still working in this, in this field. So more recently, though, uh, it's come to kind of an understanding, and I, I don't think this is surprising, that no one specific algorithm, so you see social forces is the top uh, left, uh, can actually predict well the total configuration of people in an environment. And so what this kind of graph shows is uh, each point is a different configuration of people, and the colors, uh, blue uh, being good and red not being so great, uh, show that no one of them is able to capture the entire space. And as a result, uh, this, this paper crowd space, a predictive crowd analytic technique, is helping to show that perhaps there are ways to first determine what space you're in and then apply the right algorithm to it. So we're going to take a step. And so at this point, during this, this work that I, I did, uh, I realized that I wasn't going to actually uncover some hidden human kind of underlying physical equation. And as a result, I wanted to try to rely more on kind of reinforcement learning to do that. So to kind of give a brief summary of how reinforcement learning works, so of course you have this agent there in a space, and this agent is going to have an environment uh, that is the space that they're in. And they're going to take an action. That action could just be taking steps forward, jumping, moving around. It doesn't have to just be some locomotive action. It can be something else like, uh, you know, playing a, 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 moving a piece in a game or, or playing some sort of uh, action like that. The thing to remember, too, is that the agent may not have access to the entire environment. So they may only have a sliver of kind of what they observe, and we call that state. So the agent has some state that they have access to from the environment. And then from that state, they're able to say, you know, was this, is this a good state for me to be in, so, or is it a bad state? And you attach some reward to that. The, the really kind of key component here is the policy, and that's going to tell you that given in this state that I'm in, what's my next action I should take? So a lot of academic work is focused on, on kind of the policy. For this stuff that uh, we've been working on, it's really about more determining the right reward, which is also very important. But to kind of break down that same loop and talk about the key difference that reinforcement learning has against supervised learning is that your action influences your environment. And your environment may not change, but what's important here is that your data that you capture will change. So in a sense that uh, your actions will influence sort of the state that you get back. And as a result, uh, that state is what's propelling your reward. And so there's a very close link between kind of the data you're able to, to acquire and the actions that you take. And so as a result, there um, is, a, is work done to, to try to mitigate some of those effects. So I, I'm, I'm going to go into sort of the, the math of it. And so if, this, uh, if you're a little less math inclined, just try to st stick with me, uh, because I think it, it can be understood. And that's what my hope is, to, to kind of share that intuition. So uh, in literature, the, the policy is going to be represented as, the, as pi. Um, most times, they're, they're sometimes it's represented as another uh, symbol. But let's just assume right now, and you'll most likely see it, it's, it's going to be represented as pi. The symbol right next to pi is theta. And theta are the parameters in your neural network that need to be adjusted. So really, the, the problem at hand is find the right parameters, find the right thetas. Now, the kind of inside the parentheses, you have two uh, items. So you have A of t, so that's going to be your action. And then you have S of t. Maybe not surprisingly, is that will be your state of, of at a certain time. And so what this says is, given this state, what is the probability of taking this action? And so that, that vertical bar uh, says that kind of given what's the probability of the action. Now, it's important to remember that uh, initially, when you start, th there is no meaning of whether this is good probability or bad probability. And so what you need is something called a, an advantage function, which tells you whether you're actually in a good state or a bad state, um, whether you've taken good actions or bad actions. And so the policy itself is just returning back probabilities of some given state. But you need this advantage function that actually informs you whether it's a good or a bad action. And so what that breaks down to is your past rewards minus your expected rewards. 
And so if this number is positive, it means that you're doing better than you expect. And if this number is negative, you're doing worse than you expect. Uh, in math, this represents uh, usually as a summation over sort of this gamma terms, this discounting term, um, and it's multiplied by R of T, which is your reward. So you just sum that up. Um, the, the gamma is usually to, to weigh more. So the gamma is used to say that rewards that I received today are more valuable than rewards that I received, say, 100 steps ago. Uh, so that's what the gamma is there doing. And then this V is a value function. And basically, its job is just to predict, given the state that I'm in, how much reward should I get in the future? Um, and now you might ask, how do I calculate V? Well, V is very much a supervised learning problem, and you calculate that after your episode. So you have all your information, and you basically just try to map the states to that final reward that you have. And that's how you train V, and that gives you what your, your expected reward is. I'm gonna multiply the whole thing by log. Uh, number of reasons for this, but I think the best one is that you want your numbers to behave nicely, and any time you're gonna be doing some sort of optimization using gradient descent, it's important that your numbers are well behaved. And then the last thing we're gonna do is just add an expectation operator over the whole thing. Uh, that's basically going to say that after a number of runs, I just wanna calculate the average. And what I've just showed you right now is called the vanilla uh, policy gradient. But I'm gonna be a little bit more ambitious and I'm gonna to try to give you the intuition of what is actually used. Uh, it's PPO, so this is from OpenAI. Uh, it stands for Proximal Policy Optimization, and it's really good, and I'll tell you why, and I hope to motivate why uh, it is good. So uh, imagine you have your policy. Now, again, the, the thing I tried to push forward is that your actions are going to be influencing the amount of data that you acquire. So, you, so the circle around this policy is meant to represent kind of the data that's accessible by that policy. Now, your new policy might have a different distribution of data that it, it's allowed access to. That area could be bad. And as a result, you could end up getting stuck and, being, uh, and not being able to move forward in kind of the learning process. And so the key thing here is we only wanna push our policy in a, in a sh small amount. So the question now is how do we take that philosophy of only updating our policy in a small amount and turn it into math. And so what PPO does is it's, it's gonna solve this. And I'm gonna to try to walk you through how it does it. So the first thing that we can do is take a ratio of our new policy versus our old policy. That's gonna give us R. And these are probabilities, so we can take uh, kind of the division of them. Now, R again is just going to be a measure. We need to have an understanding of whether this is good or bad. And so again, we just bring in our advantage function to, to tell us that. So we can map out R. And so R, is, because it's probabilities, your lowest value is gonna be zero. And it's gonna go up to some amount. I'm gonna put one here. That one's kind of special because that just means that your new policy is the same as your old policy. So uh, your advantage function, again, is just going to be some scalar, some uh, amount. And so a positive scalar times this kind of growing R, you should expect kind of this linear line. And so uh, this is for uh, events that are good. So to, to just break this down a little bit more, it's saying that uh, you know, we have this ratio and, and in the last kind of iteration, our advantage function said that we did better than we expected. So if we do better than we expected, then we want to take those actions more often. So we want to increase the probabilities of those um, actions. And so we want to increase uh, our policy. And so this dot just says, given some sort of R, we're gonna to wanna to push that R up and update. Uh, so the next time we come around, our policy is being pushed in the upward direction. Now we'll just do the same for if the advantage function is negative, meaning that we have done uh, worse than we expected. And so again, that's just some negative number and we're just multiplying that by a growing R. So we get this negative kind of linear line. And then again, if we have a point, it's important to remember that we're going in the up direction. Now, the problem here is if R is big or if R is small. So let's say R is big. It means that our new policy has higher probabilities of taking certain actions. So as a result, we might move too far in that direction. And so really what PPO is doing is it's clamping at a certain point, saying that at some point, 
uh, of our value, we're not gonna push kind of it any higher than it should be. And then for the negative side, we're also gonna do the same. So we're clamping it at some sort of negative. Now, oftentimes, this is represented, so this little box that I drew around, uh, the width of that box is two epsilon, and so the epsilon value that's used in practice is usually 0.2. Um, but what's also really nice about this kind of negative one is that uh, you're able to kind of undo sort of the policy that you just have because you're pushing it back to one, which is closer to the old policy that you uh, had initially. So Unity's in the title, so now, now's Unity's turn. So uh, PPO, uh, which is the algorithm that we just talked about, is one of the options that's in this kind of ML agents kind of uh, work. And what's great about this is you don't need to implement this. You just type in PPO in your config file along with some hyperparameters. Uh, there are a lot of hyperparameters here, so that epsilon that I talked about is a hyperparameter. I'm not gonna have time to talk about how to, to, how to tune that. Um, underlying Unity ML is PyTorch. So uh, if you're familiar with that framework, that's kind of what's running the whole thing. Uh, Unity is kind of wrapping up what's uh, often called a, a gym. So OpenAI has a gym kind of framework that allows you to create environments. Unity is just allowing you to do that directly in Unity itself. And then the last thing that I wanna mention is that Unity is using Barracuda Inference Engine. So this is their inference engine. Uh, inference, for those who are not familiar, is just how you take your trained model and actually deploy it and, and use it. And the file format that they use is Onyx, which is an open neural network exchange format. And you can just, uh, it will read those files. So you can do more than just RL. You can do supervised learning in uh, Unity if you want. So image uh, object detection and image classification. So uh, how does that map to Unity? So Unity has a number of functions that you just over, override. So one of them is on episode begin. So that just sets up your agent, your environment. You have collect observations. So that's just mapping your environment to a specific state. And then you have on action received, which is going to allow you to determine how much reward you wanna give for a certain action and then what action you should take. Um, and I'll show you. And then the policy, which we just talked about, you just set in the, in the config file. So, uh, code example. So here's a very simple problem, somewhat analogous to what we're doing, is uh, we have a ball and we just want it to hit a box. Um, it's kind of in there, kind of getting up and running with Unity ML. So uh, the kind of on episode begin is just initializing where that ball placement is and where the box is. And then collect observations is really saying you have sort of a vector of numbers and you can just add numbers to that vector. So that's mapping uh, the state. And then on action received allows you to read from another buffer. Uh, this buffer is called action buffers. And then you describe, uh, you know, what each of those values means. In this problem, uh, it's going to be the forces in the X. And because Unity uh, is in a different coordinate system than, than others, the Z, which will be to the kind of horizontal plane. And then if you have kind of your end state, then you can set a reward. So now we're going to detour. Okay, so uh, this is Rudolf Kalman. Uh, he was a Hungarian electrical engineer, uh, born in uh, Budapest, and uh, his work is famous for um, also being a part of the Apollo program because uh, his work was found by Stanley Schmidt, who saw what he was doing and thought this would be great to include in the kind of control systems uh, for the rockets. So Kalman, Common's goal really is to know where this rocket is in space. Um, and there, ideally that rocket is where you want it to be in space, but there are really kind of two methods that you have access to. The first one is you have your equations, uh, you apply them, but you'll know that they're very sensitive to initial conditions. So you'll get drift over time. So what you also have is a very expensive sensor that will kind of inform you to the best of its abilities, kind of where it thinks its rocket is. So, so Kalman's uh, goal is, given those two things, I have sort of how my system moves uh, through some equations, and then I also have access to a sensor, how best to combine those two pieces of information to have the best representation of my state. So that's the problem. Uh, and I'll walk you through how you can kind of get to a pretty close formulation of, of how this works. So we have system A, and then we have our sensor B and we want to get to C. 
So let's start with a super simple example. Our sensor is, is perfect. There's zero error. So uh, in this case, what we want to do is put all of our trust in our sensor. And so the best that we can do is say that C eventually is going to just be B. Um, now I'm going to write it in this kind of odd format, but the way I like to think of it is that we have some sort of position A, and we need to know how much we need to move A to get it to where B is. And so by taking the difference of B minus A, we're, we know how much to move. Um, but again, you can just cancel out the A's and you get C. Now, if we take the flip side of that, where now uh, our system uh, is perfect and uh, we have some error on our sensor we don't care about, then we can just trust all of our system. Um, so if we take that last equation that we had, what can we add to it to kind of get it to where it finally equals C equals A? And so uh, we can just multiply that by zero. Does the trick. Um, so now we kind of have a system of equations. We have sort of this formula and we have kind of two states. Uh, when m is zero, um, x equals zero. And when m is one, we know that y equals zero. So we need some equation that takes x and y and returns those m amounts at when uh, x and y equal those amounts. So uh, to get m equals one when y is zero, we can do that. So we just take x over x, that will return one. We just now need to know where we put y. So we know y is zero in this case. So we can just add it to the bottom. And then we need to check to make sure that the fact is that when x equals zero, we do actually have m, the whole equation itself, equals zero. So if x is zero, then zero on the numerator, and then y is some sort of amount, so it becomes zero. So I'm gonna change m to k, and now k is kind of described in that fashion, and k is called the Kalman gain. So it's the optimal way to kind of uh, weigh those two systems given that you know sort of error in between those two. And then you use C to be your new state in A and you just kind of run this in an iteration, um, kind of glancing over some stuff. But uh, when we take this actually and we bump it up to matrix operations, of course it looks a little bit more um, complicated, but really it's the sort of same uh, component. So what I'm highlighting now is uh, sort of this system error plus the sensor error component. Uh, so R is the covariance of the observation noise. I'm just calling that sensor error. And then uh, uh, sort of P of K is kind of the, the noise in your, your system. Now H's are what's called observation matrices. And that just collapses some parts of your system if you don't have sensors for them. So you don't always have uh, sensors to, to measure your acceleration and your velocity. You may only have position. And so H kind of collapses those components that you don't want to match. So you're matching apples to apples. And then this last part, the Kalman gain, is really just the system error divided by this SK term that we just found is the system error plus the sensor error. And uh, because you don't have division in matrix operations, you, of course, takes the, the inverse. And so you kind of put them together. And H is there, again, just to knock off the terms that you don't have. So I'm going to now show this uh, in, in a demo. And it's a lot more fun to actually see this work. So OK. All right, there we go. So uh, double pendulums are really great to, to, to model because they are so chaotic. Um, and so what you're seeing is this little blue dot is representing a sensor going off. The sensor rate is 100 frames. So every 100 frames, you're getting a sensor go off. And it's just recording its position. So uh, there are a number of things here. But the reason that double pendulums are, are great is because they're so sensitive to initial condition. And so there are actually two pendulums that were there uh, to begin with. And so we can imagine, for the purpose of this demonstration, that the blue pendulum is the real world. Uh, we don't have access to it. And, but what we do have is a good model of the real world, and that's the gray. And so what we want to do is use the Kalman filter uh, to actually get this to, to link on by taking uh, information from that sensor that the real world is kind of um, sporadically uh, taking off. So what we're going to do is now we're going to have the Kalman gain on, and we're taking that sensor reading. And what you'll see is the gray kind of diverges, but then it snaps back on every time it takes a sensor reading. And so we have some initial error, which is higher than the last case. And then we have some sensor error. And so now what you'll also see 
is this also kind of just jumps off. And the re reason being is that, again, this is highly nonlinear system and a very, very sensitive. Um, so what you do in this case is what we can do is we're gonna decrease uh, or give sensor readings more often. And so by taking sensor readings, say, every 17 frames, we can lock on really quickly uh, because we're taking so many readings. And so you can adjust this, of course, you know, to uh, take sensor readings every 30 frames or so, and you'll get more drift in between those, those readings. You can then also, of course, uh, increase how much air is in your sensor. So you know, our sensor now is pretty noisy, and you can kind of notice that the blue is kind of jumping around and not on any of the paths. And so, and the kind of uh, visual at the bottom just represents how far they're diverging. Now, uh, when you do calm and gain stuff, you'll also f uh, hit uh, um, what's called the ensemble calm and gain, and ensemble just meaning a lot, uh, a number uh, of, of these models. So what you do in practice is you actually run multiple of them, um, of these models. And so now, right now, we're running 10, and what you'll see is what we could do is we take the average, so now the average is in red, and we'll find that that red tracks a lot better um, than just doing one of them specifically. Um, the last thing I will, I'll do is I'm gonna really bump up the ensemble count so my uh, frame rate will die, but uh, what you'll see, and you can barely see it really, is that the red is tracking really well on that um, kind of uh, real world, the blue, even though our, our you know, uh, we have noise in our sensor. So ensemble, calm, and filter, seen kind of in action. The other term that you'll hit too is extended calm and filter, and I don't have a demonstration of that because we can decrease the sensor rate here, but extended just means you take into the fact that you're dealing with a nonlinear system, and so you need to take the Jacobian of your kind of transition matrix, and that gives you a better representation of doing this. But the same principle is there, how best to kind of take your sensor data and some equation of state. Okay, so back to the presentation. All right, so why did I tell you that? <laughs> so uh, uh, the, the Kalman gain, um, because it's kind of um, trying to minimize the error between two source uh, data, might actually make a really good method for calculating reward when you have data to use. And so this paper called the Statistical Similarity Measure for Aggregate Crowd Dynamics uh, was kind of the first to push forward this idea of using the Kalman filter uh, as a way to measure how well data and simulation match. So let's get back on track. So this is a video of kind of the work that we did. So first you need data. So this is data from um, mutable crowds, uh, a paper, morphable crowds. And what really the data is, is it's just uh, point uh, time position history. So from that time position history, you get trajectories, and each agent has a kind of time position history, and uh, so we have that data. Then what we'll do is we'll construct a similar world um, in kind of unity, and we'll assign uh, our training agent one of those paths, and we'll also then uh, simulate all of the other agents that are around during that time. Um, so this is, of course, sped up. The black lines that you see out of the agent that's learning, so the agent that's learning right now is kind of fumbling around because it's still early in the training, and they're up at the top um, in white, and then the, the agents that kind of reach their destination immediately are the ones from the data itself. Uh, so the black lines are uh, mimicking or visualizing sight, and so that's just taking kind of positions of, of all of the objects in its, in its view. And uh, so, uh, as this kind of training goes on, we start to see this agent better reach its terminal position. So that terminal position is, is marked in green, and uh, that's kind of what the data is suggesting the terminal position to be. And what's really, I think, important here is that the only reward that we're using is this sort of this, this, uh, this entropy-based equation that has no uh, additional reward for reaching your kind of trajectory. Uh, so it's a very hands-off kind of approach. Really, once we had this reward metric, what we were really focused in on is giving the agent the right amount of information so it can better learn kind of this environment. So this is final results, and so um, I'll also kind of have a very quick demonstration of this as well. But uh, we see that this agent sort of is able to navigate around um, 
uh, objects and has some understanding of kind of not trying to totally hit into someone. But again, the, the data that we're working on too, I think it's important to, to mention is it's really only about 20 to 30 trajectories. So not a lot of data, but we're still able to get an agent that performs somewhat uh, characteristic. So uh, to see kind of the graphs of what happens, so if you're ever training and you see a graph like this, this is not good. <laughs> um, ideally, you want this, this kind of graph to go up much more. And uh, so up is good, and then uh, uh, the kind of horizontal axis is over kind of the entire uh, training process. And so we're training over a million steps. Uh, and on this computer, it takes about seven hours to give you a sense. So the reason that one's not so great is that we gave the agent no sight. So the agent really doesn't understand anything around it. Uh, we just give the agent kind of its final trajectory and um, kind of where it is in space, but no sight. Um, this is a better looking graph, and this is when we have sight. So uh, those black lines that you saw in that video, that represents sight. Now one question you might have is what if we just keep increasing sight? So let's say we had sort of 40 lines representing and we just double it to 80. Um, we don't do much better. So there is some sort of limit, of course, that uh, just giving your agent so much information may not actually be beneficial. So reducing that information that you give to your agent actually um, allows it to learn a lot faster. And so what this new line kind of represents is when you look at all the information that you're giving your agent and reducing it down to only giving it kind of key um, parts. So really, this could just be reducing kind of one dimension. So does the agent really need to know horizontal or um, altitude information? So that could be something uh, like an example. And then the last thing, uh, the, the kind of best graph is uh, when you do data augmentation. So super simple one is you just rotate your kind of platform and uh, that gives you a lot more data to work with. Um, and then the last thing is curriculum learning. So the idea being um, that you wanna first train your agent on maybe 10 trajectories and then you give them 15 and then you finally give them 20. Um, and so that way it's able to kind of generalize um, over a larger set by still being able to kind of capture key things it needs to know over a smaller one. So the, the reason that this is pretty fascinating is once you have an agent that's trained, you can take that agent and put them in environments that they never have seen before um, and that the data themselves never had had. So, um, all right, let's see if this um, Okay, so this is a very simple demonstration. And again, these agents were only trained over 20 trajectories. The tra trajectories were only about two or three seconds. And so what we can do is then just spawn a bunch of them and you know, have them kind of all kind of grasp towards a, a specific point. Um, and so you might see some, some applicability here, one for entertainment, but also one for being able to quantify certain kind of characteristics. And so we can kind of restart that and see how they all kind of drift towards that sort of point. Again, they're not getting any specific reward for reaching their destination. So they don't really have that like desire to like always hit that endpoint. They more so just wanna capture the overall behavior. And that's what that uh, kind of entropy metric does. So, um, Okay, so to close up this presentation. Uh, so closing thoughts. So, so why is this kind of cool, I think? Um, the agents will be able to generalize the behavior from their data set. So the, the kind of data that we grabbed was interesting because each data set had a characteristic, a human emotion attached to it. So there was one that was more uh, of kind of a shy movement across that corridor, and there was one that was more aggressive. And so you can take those kind of uh, behaviors, try to boil them and generalize them into an agent, and then you could see how they interact uh, between each other. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are other use cases. Uh, so what I'm looking for more, and I'm sure a lot of people, of course, always like, is more data sets to do this. And then what would be really fascinating is if you can close the pipeline so that you have some sort of camera feed that's able to capture trajectories and then use that immediately as data to capture, uh, and that would allow you to construct agents for different types of spaces that you can then deploy. Um, so thank you. I, I hope I, I, I taught you guys everything and then um, here's my contact information, so.